Hey everybody, I'm Ryo Yamaguchi, the publicist at Copper Canyon Press, and you are watching season two of our interview series, Line Break, which goes off the page and into the homes and minds of our beloved poets. We began Line Break as a way to connect during the severe lockdowns of the pandemic, and we've had so much fun seeing poets on screen, hearing poems, talking about writing, books, and life, that we simply had to keep this series going. Thank you for tuning in. So I'm super excited this week to welcome Kate Marvin, a poet I've admired since being handed a copy of a fragment of Ahead of a Queen in the stairwell of Lind Hall in Minneapolis, where I did my MFA, having stood there for a second to read and immediately fall in love with the first poem of that book. Uh, now Kate joins Copper Canyon for the first time with its incredible new book, I Am Astonished. Kate, I am so glad to be sitting with you. How's your morning going? It's a little like um, not so great. You know, I normally yeah. um, have a very rigorous morning where I get myself out of bed and I go to exercise class. I literally just like take myself there and deposit myself there and make myself do a whole bunch of vigorous exercise. But um, this morning didn't really start out. Like I, I canceled my exercise class and so I decided to sleep, sleep in a little bit. So I'm not feeling great about myself this morning, right? But I have like my friend, the iced coffee to help me start things up. I'm, I'm literally like, um, my house has been under construction, like some renovations have been going on for, I don't know, maybe like, it's been like over a year. And so I just have like, you know, construction stuff, like oh, yeah. everything's messed up. And um, I just sort of like, you know, try and like keep structure in my life with exercise. And so, so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking I might like paint a room today or is that just try to move forward in the project of getting my home back together. That's yeah, yeah. So I feel, yeah, I feel it's so you're like doubly, triply disrupted or that kind of thing. Does it throw you off to like not to to have your morning routine kind of thrown off like that, or is it, or you just kind of feeling? I mean, I'm a little tired this morning too, but mostly because I've been up for maybe too long. But yeah, you know, I mean, I feel like it's it kind of like I'm really like an all or nothing person. So once I get going, it's like then then it's going to happen. And I feel like the energy is starting to kick in, you know, because I have I have some things I want to do today, and and I and like it's, you know, I'm trying to think about the disruption part. Um, well, right now I'm just so accustomed to it. And, and uh, my life has been disrupted yeah. for like the past, um, I don't know, maybe two years, almost two years, a year and a half. Cause I got, I, I started going through a divorce a year and a half ago. And so, you know, divvying up belongings and like, you know, separating things and, and situating myself and figuring out like with well, the house is hugely symbolic and actually just very realistic. And then that I'm trying to move on a lot of projects I couldn't do when I was married. <clears throat> and also I'm now in, just about to enter into summer mode, which involves like a lot of house projects like painting and um, gardening projects. So that's pretty much like, well, I'll do like all day and I'll like write at night or write some, but it's a good like thinking space for me, you know, yeah, to be like yeah. working on stuff. So this, I was talking to this one poet a few summers ago and he was like, you know, what have you been doing? I was like, well, I've been painting. And he was like, he thought I was like, you know, painting like watercolors or something like that. And I was like, dude, who yeah. has time for that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Well, I, I mean, like, uh, uh, I hear there's something like maybe Zen in that or something like, do you feel like, like, are you writing poems like while you're, you know, uh, a paint the fence up down, you know, that kind of thing. Like, um, yeah. Do you feel like you're working on creative projects in the midst of, you know, those things? Like, yes. Yeah. yeah. I think that like doing this stuff is like, I'm thinking the whole time, like God knows it's just like, it's a thinking yeah. project, you know? So a lot of the poems, like there's some poems in event horizon, like, like the violets poem where, where, you know, it's about thinking while gardening you know, and like thinking yeah, from your right. past. So a lot of it is like, you know, like when you're gardening, garden, gardening for me is a lot like writing a poem because you're like rearranging things and like digging things up and it's just, it's really active. And, and for me, like, like my favorite parts of writing poems are like when you really excavate them and rearrange them and like make them completely weird, you know? So, yeah, um, yeah. so gardening has become something. I'm not a good gardener also. I basically just dig a lot of things up. That's like my favorite yeah. thing to do is get rid of things. It's like, it's like like a revision process. I just need to, if I had more money, then I would be planting things. But, um, but you know, it's been this sort of long-term. I'm also trying to like rewild my yard. And so, yeah, yeah. Um, so I With, like, have- like native plants kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. like all native plants. So I have a landscaper who's helped me, um, he's gonna help me figure out what to plant, but I also am creating a meadow because I have an enormous lawn, mm. a really big lawn that was pretty much, you would just mow it and it was kind of, serve no purpose except to be a lawn really pretty big piece of land and um yeah, yeah, so yeah. 
I was like, I don't want to mow that. But it turns out that mowing is really fun. Like I was really, you know, my, cause my ex-husband did all the mowing and I was like, I was like, I, well, who, who am I to mow a lawn? It turns out that with a rider mower, it's very easy. You could probably get drunk yeah. on the lawn, you know? Um, some people probably do. I know a few people who have, yeah. Um, <laughs> George Jones famously actually, maybe, I, but, um, oh boy, you're touching on a lot of things here. I love the metaphor of gardening as poetry and, and kind of the way you're saying it too, like this excavation, you know? Uh, I'm also reminded of an anecdote that I've always held on to about Wallace Stevens that he began every morning with a flower arrangement. Um, you know, however you feel about Wallace Stevens or, or whatever, but um, what, a, what a delicate, lovely uh, thought, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. I actually, um, I mean, one thing I do, I have been doing in my house and is, is having flowers every day, like making sure that I yeah. always have flowers in the kitchen. And that's also sort of for my kid who's now 13. Like I want them to, you know, have that sort of, you know, sort of almost like take that kind of thing for granted, you know, have beauty around. Yeah. You know? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'm also really into like the decorating and so that like, uh, you know, and, the, and furniture and things like that. Like I've spent a lot of time holed up in, um, in Facebook marketplace, like, you know, looking for like mid-century modern furniture. That's a huge obsession of mine. I mean, I actually, this room is really hideous right now, but I, you can see I have this really great, like, mm -hmm. Yeah, oh sure. yeah 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 this is I my love that, that chair I just, too yeah i just made this um room this year and so it's like a room to just it, it's completely like messed up right now but it's going to be a reading room yeah yeah it's i'm feeling like, a, tr how a triangular decadent is that? you just have a room for reading you know i really feel like i've arrived yeah for sure no that is decadent but that's decadent in a poet's way you know i think that's which is mm -hmm. wonderful like um uh, well, no, and, and I'm 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 grateful to have the stack of books. I'm I'm feeling a, a, an A-frame triangular affinity with you as I am in this yes. space, which is not my us my typical space here, but um, but we've got. Well, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm like to half an A-frame yeah. here. Like this is um, and so so I found this guy who um would do. Hang on, I don't know if you can see this. Who built me um shelves, and he's been building the shelves sort of throughout the house, and they're very like um, they're not perfect. Like some people might have issues with these shelves, but I really like them because they're so funky. And you know, and homemade. There's another yeah. one across the way. Yeah, okay. yeah, There's those are super cool. In, in the bedroom, like over there, my kid has one. I'm gonna have one. So that's been another big project. Is like, well, I mean, frankly, it's like finding space for the books. You know, I mean, this is a yeah, lot. Of books. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's very functional. But but then it's also, I mean, there's something aesthetic and um, and emotionally meaningful about how you contain your books, right? Like, I mean, and especially for something like your new reading space that. Um, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think like it's like you know, your books are your friends. Yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. so and it's like it's like all your people are just surrounding you. You know, so yeah. I love it, and I actually am like you know, I've been um, many times um, made to feel bad about not being alphabetized. Are you yeah. alphabetized? Like you alphabetize my my um, shelf or do you? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I do. Well, um, I, I do, but I break them up more. I mean, I also break them up kind of by genre, I guess. Um, yeah, you know, so I mean, so the poets are all in one place. I've actually on my case, that's, that's not totally true. Like I so, so I've got like, just a poetry like bookcase. And then I've got certain presses that I have so like wave books where I worked at Copper Canyon, you know, so all those presses are together. And then past that, then it's like anthologies. And then after that, then it gets like, alphabetized but um so yeah, like a couple i don't have that yeah. at all like i have like cookbooks yeah. mixed in with poetry mixed in with you know oh, it's, it's a nightmare yeah. and so the thing is i did have it alphabetized at one point and then it got mixed up when i moved because i've moved many many times and they just got completely messed up and then a bunch of my books went to my office and i was using them to teach with and all, they're all still like stranded there in staten island and so, so my books are totally disorganized but i really like the process of trying to find a book you know, and going through all the other books and being like, like, just like, oh, and here's this and here's this and here's this, you know, and so, um, it's, it's, I like it. I mean, if I didn't like it, I would do something about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, but for I, sure. I, I love it. I'm hearing this is like, a, yeah, like the disorder of the world forces you to interact with the world, right? Or something like that. Like it makes you, it makes you engage. Yeah. But everybody's here, you know, like all the yeah. books are here. It's not like, you know, they're not here. They're all here. And I've had them forever. I've been carting these books around with me for so long. There was a, when I finished my PhD at University of Cincinnati, um, you know, I, I got a job at the College of Staten Island. They don't pay for you to move. And I was, I had been a graduate student for like four years and I'm super broke by that point. And so I left, I just moved my books and I got rid of all my furniture, all of it. 
and yeah, like yeah. all of it. And then I moved to New York and uh, my books were mailed. They were like 26 boxes or something like that. And then I just lived on an air mattress for like two months. Like I would like sleep and grade on this air mattress with my books yeah, around. Yeah. It was it surrounded was, by these boxes. Of, mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Totally. So these books have been with me for a really long time. And when it's been suggested that I get rid of them, I get really uh, like, I'm, I'm not pleased by that. You know, yeah. I did get rid of a whole bunch. Like I unloaded them at this church sale at Maplewood, New Jersey. And they were all those, there were a bunch of like signed copies that I would like, that I just bought to be like nice, you know, at yeah. various yeah. Yeah, conferences. Yeah, yeah. And then um, there's, I went back a few days later and they had this sign that someone had written like in sort of weak lettering, like no more books, please. Cause I just like completely <laughs> unloaded like 500 books on them. And they were like, we can't get rid of these. <laughs> that's, that's so funny. I've, I mean, yeah, I it's, I've talked to different poets about this, of, of the, the sort of the push pull of books. I mean, certain, some poets, I know they, uh, their relationship with books is just really fluid. They kind of come in and out of their lives. They gift them, they sell them, you know, and then, and then other ones, I'm, I think I'm a bit more like you, maybe kind of a, a hoarder or something. Like I, I really, I really loathe to get rid of any book at all. Like, but, um, yeah. Yes. Well, um, yeah, yeah. I'm not a hoarder, but I like to have my books. Like I want yeah, my books. Yeah, for sure. Back. Yeah, for sure. I don't mean to complain like from, that way. But you know, yeah. I'll look at a book that I read when I was 18, you know, and I'm like, wow, I have like my, my handwriting from when I was that old, you know? Um, yeah, they're, 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 they're precious. Yeah. Um, this gives me kind of an opportunity. I mean, so we're touching on, oh, I mean, you're bringing up so many things that are kind of part of the themes of things that I wanted to kind of interact with today. Um, this idea of disruption and 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 looking back into your life uh, across a schism, you know, or something like that, um, uh, as well as um, the idea of friendship and books as friends um, and those mm-hmm. things. But before we get before we get kind of like into all of that, um, I, I do I, I think we know who you are now, uh, Kate Marvin. I, um, and uh, and we and you have the new book, and I kind of want to show that off um, very quickly because we're like super super proud of it, um, which is this one here. Um, I the love back. this one. Um, yeah, yeah. So here's the back. I was just going to kind of mention. I was I was really staring at this um, uh, for quite a while, both the front and back of this. Um, the artist here, right, is um, uh, tell, tell us about the artist, it's Marina. Clark, um, right. Well, I don't know the artist at all. I found the artist online, mm. and yeah. so I was sort of you know doing a Google for images like women, etc. And then mm-hmm. I found this, and it was in it was in an article that was sort of about d- representing different artists for I think it was like a. You know, I barely remember. It was for like an exhibit for women, women artists. And I found these and then I was just like, oh, that's it. And there's a whole, you know, like if you Google her, she has this whole um, collection of these photographs that she's sewn on. This is actually, she's hand sewn these, this, these blood droplets. Oh, so okay. It, yeah. All of these things are superimposed upon the same image, which is an image of a body of a woman, a woman who's like had several children and who isn't super young. And so it's like all these things are like superimposed on her and they're really amazing. And so yeah, I just, yeah. that, 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 you know, it's like, I, I just knew it when I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I love the, the, there's a tactile feel now to that, that I didn't, that I didn't get before without knowing that, the, that those had been thrown on um, those the superimpositions. Yeah, that's really amazing. Do you want, um, this might be, I've got like some kind of like standard intro questions I like to ask, but sure. kind of where we are now, um, kind of where we are now, I, I kind of think actually, I wouldn't mind hearing a poem if, if you've got a poem ready, uh, okay. read from it. Um, and maybe we, could, maybe we could start there, yeah. Um, sure, okay. Um, I'm gonna read I mean, if you're, if you're cool with that, but yeah, yeah. I'm totally cool with it. Um, I just wanna figure out where, I kind of figured out what to read and I kind of didn't. Okay, I'm gonna read a poem called War on Fun. War on Fun. In a deceitful time with a deceitful friend, I stayed at sea for days called sea days on a vessel with casinos for hallways as triumphant waves licked the ship's sides in blackest night and luscious wet bodies leapt the smack balls over nets on the pool deck. It was my birthday and the poor cell phone service disguised the lack of a call or text from a man I longed back then to call my boyfriend. I drank in dazzles, a lounge like a theater that morphed from dance party to game show within an hour, ordering double whiskeys by the dozens, the bill accruing invisibly, almost like a portent, a receipt unspooling into the fathoms of a sky that seemed to move its length like a giant cat 
alongside the wind and water whipping up at me from the deck side where I stood smoking one cigarette after another. My dreadful friend, latent back then like a disease, claimed seasickness, chewed on Dramamine, cluttered our birth with products designed to make her privates hygienic, worthy, chemical, or, as she said, because she was so sensitive down there. The only reason I was on that ship was due to a conflict between her and her rehab friend who cut her off after the fatal discovery of, of stolen pills. This friend had booked the trip for her birthday and my birthday happened to be one day after the all cost paid trip was a mere $400. So I thought I may as well experience it. The lower level art gallery with art so ugly, it stood in direct opposition to notions of art. And what I was doing there was due to my being in a weak position. I was lonely. The purpose of the journey, it soon became apparent, was to experience fun, which was doled out in many formulas and flavors, none of which agreed with me. It was, I saw, a metaphor for the life I had not yet lived and avert at every corner I turn. A friend whose sleep is malicious, who concocts tales of having once seen a ghost in your attic, who is described unremarkably as donned in a long white nightgown, a candlestick clutched in her hands, her hair wild and white. Was that me wandering my attic just above my own head? I'm not the medium. I have no funnel to prop open to the essence of the other world. I have failed to distinguish between a friend who is devoted to me and the friend now approaching as I stand by the railing, smoking, pouring myself into the task of regarding the voluminous carpet of the sea, her hand gentle at my back. On those sea days and nights, how she smiled, as she smiled at me often, watching me trip and tasting my shoe on the step in the back of her throat. Now that I have experienced so much intentional fun, I have given up on fun. Now that this venal friend has made her apology years after, I do not accept. I do not accept fun, the fun that is for liars, peering down and over the ship's side from which hundreds of lifeboats hung. Oh, that's so awesome. I, I, um, that last image is one that has really sticks with me. I mean, throughout the entire collection. Um, but I was also, I, I remember reading that poem for the first time and kind of chuckling because I remember having a lot of friends who, I assume this is like a spring break cruise kind of thing or something. It's a cruise. Like, yeah, it's like, me, yeah. It's a cruise. And you know, um, I forget what it was like one of those Norwegian cruise lines. So it was like a four day mm -hmm. all expenses cruise. And yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah. it was also the first time I had been away. I had, I think a two-year-old at the time. It was the first time I had been away from my baby. And so, and it was like, and what happened is, you know, my friend um, kind of disappeared and went to sleep. Just went and like, just, this wasn't going to hang out, yeah, you know? Yeah. And I was on a cruise for days. So I, uh, it was actually fantastic. What I did well, so was like, I wasn't going to hang out at all. Like, yeah. Was um, asleep, was a, like, went to bed. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but what was great was I did something that I really loved. I, I love doing in my single life in my non mother life, which is I went and I got my journal and I just got, went and got my journal and I just drank, I just drank tons of whiskeys and just wrote in my journal for like mm -hmm. hours. And, and the, the wait staff was so confused as to like what I was doing. You know, <laughs> and then, and, and then I just go smoke cigarettes. And then I would even like get involved in some of the activities, you know, just by myself, like, like I've, I have done things where I like travel alone and I just go and do shit, you know, by myself. It's, it's kind of fun, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. So, so that was like actually like, um, a really want a, a really great night. I wouldn't mind reliving. Yeah. I hear this like an accidental self-actualization or something like that by, you know, as a result of being ghosted, I guess it's another it's a, a term that like comes, you know, is I think also very prevalent in this collection, but, um, the, yeah, uh, I, yeah. I want to, yeah, yeah no, ahead, I'm thinking, yeah. you know, because this is such a very different, you know, I have those like five guzzles for a friend who I, who I, I guess, I don't want to use the word lost, but I guess lost is the right word. I have a great deal of fondness for that friend. Like those, to my mind, those are kind of a series, even though this, this poems are pretty bitter. They're kind of a series of love poems in a lot of ways. This is not a love poem. And this yeah. is, this is, you know, this is about, um, you know, this is, this isn't about like, I want you back. This is about like, what the fuck was, what the fuck happened? 
in that in that situation, yeah. you know. Um, so I don't know. If yeah, that's yeah. Question. But I also just like this. You know, I really feel I, I whenever people talk about having fun, I feel a real like. I'm just like, what the fuck is fun? You know, well, I have fun all the time, but like when people are purposely pursuing fun and like frivolous activities, it's not something I have a whole lot of respect for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or this idea of like up. that fun has to be like uh, precious or something. It has to be encapsulated in this, well, like a cruise or something. Yeah. Well, so. these people, they literally are, they're going to have fun. And it's like, don't you just like find fun in regular things? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything yeah, yeah. Fun? And you know, it reminds me of my, my aunt who has dementia, but she was very, when she had to go into assisted living, she, she started crying and she said, it's just not fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was like, who told wow. you everything was going to be fun? Like she went through her life thinking everything should be fun. Anyway, I don't know. I mean, I really think it's probably, you know, my, my father and me, who's like a sort of dour person. He, well, he had yeah. no time for fun. So, um, so that's probably just like a bit of him that landed in me. Plus, you know, yeah, it's you like, think that you've just carried that through. Yeah. Well, also it's like, okay, like ZZ Packer was one of my best friends. She's a fiction writer. She would say mm -hmm. vacation. Like the last thing I want is a vacation because she just wants time to work on her book. You know? So a lot of writers are like, yeah. they're like, and another friend of mine, um, Na Naeem Murr, who I haven't talked to in a million years, he would say when we were at the university of Houston, he'd say, if you saw people sitting around, like, I need your time. Give me your time. You know, that's kind of, yeah. like, I think when you're a writer, you sort of feel like, okay, I only have so much of this in which to get everything done. That I want to get done, you know? So the idea of being idle is a little offensive. Yeah. That's so fascinating. I, I mean, and I hear what you're saying too. I mean that, um, well, yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I guess like other poets might say that that part of their their process is idleness, you know, or, or needing to just be free to kind of wander around or something like that, which kind of sounds like sort of what happened on the cruise, like for you. But um, well, I was writing in my journal the whole time smoking. I mean, I was pretty active. I know I don't yeah. like not being active, but, you know, that's just I'm kind of a hyper person. I like, you know, I don't smoke pot. It's it's way too much of a, like, a, you know, it doesn't like suit me because I like drag you down. Stuff. And that's just me. That's just like how maybe I'm maybe I'm just trying to. I don't. I'm I'm actually kind of like trying to learn to sit with myself more, and process. Yeah. That's been something that's been a challenge over a couple of years because I'm always on to the next thing or or doing stuff. And I I but like I said before, I like to think while doing stuff. You yeah. Know? Yeah. W w would you not equate like the act of like writing a poem with something like meditation or something like that? Like I think that those are often strongly aligned. But if we're kind of talking, I kind of feel like maybe meditation seems too passive or um, yeah. It's not meditation for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. For me, it's more um, of, it would be more like, you know, something more like a dance or you yeah. know, it's an engagement. It's very much an engagement and it's very, there's nothing still about it in the writing of it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this makes you think of like, uh, so one, one question I kind of had for you was somewhat of a formal question that I'm, that I'm kind of trying to rapidly re-articulate here in my mind, but um, it's the sort of idea of like how you tell stories and how you tell a good story in a poem, and particularly the kind of story that you tell in these poems, which is something that's very acutely focused, I think, that, that is sequencing like a lot of details or number of details that have, um, you know, resonance, meaning, um, have this kind of symbolic weight. But the thing is, is that I think that these poems in this book in particular move so rapidly that those details are kind of meant to sort of spin in the air or something like that, like plates um, versus, um, you know, being kind of heavy and, and static and, and, and meant to kind of, you know, a deep, what we call deep image, I would say, you know, um, but that's just sort of my interpretation. I was kind of curious if you might talk a little bit about um, your sense of line and rhythm in this book in particular um, and how you think maybe it's kind of developed from, you know, from, from your other work, like, you know. Okay, that's a really good question. So, so the way that like I work with a line, I should just say right off the bat, is like I'm really obsessed with the line. But you know, I I think that poems have to sort of fall into a form, right? The, to me, the form is so evocative of what the poem is. So, for example, like the poem um, "Lottery of Eyes," the first poem in the book, is you know that had to have this really weird suspended enjambment because it's supposed to feel sort of like like it's teetering on something. I, I wanted it to, it to feel really floaty, you know. 
and like sort of it's like very unlike a poem I normally write but a lot of times what I do when I'm working with the line is I try and tighten everything up so the line that has a lot of integrity and then I sort of pack it in and get everything to line up almost it's very much like sewing right and 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 tightening everything and then and then and then going to any sort of weak line and like reconfiguring that line so like my whole thing my thinking is that you, every line has to kind of really be beautiful or so do something you know like there's no wasted line, there's no wasted room. Um, so, so a lot of my process is like it happens in the reworking and with revision happens in the reworking of individual lines and getting the whole thing stitched together to make a thing and moving stuff around so that there's an arrangement, you know? Doesn't sound very interesting, but it sure is a bitch. It's probably the most fun part of doing it too. Um, Kate, it's so amazing to uh, hear about this, uh, the way that you think of line, um, you know, it's kind of stitching together and um, and I really hear that like in formal qualities. And so, but going back to kind of um, another part of that question, which is um, how do you think that differs from your previous work? Like, like how have you developed, you know, um, in Event Horizon? I think that, um, that, you know, the poems, I just looked over the book and I realized that um, the majority of the poems in the book are on couplets, which is a much looser form yeah. than I normally employ. And, um, and I think that, you know, if there was a much more like of a, of a concentration or a density in the work, like an Oracle, which has um, a number of like very dense poems, some poems, in fact, that um, people mistake for prose poems that are not prose poems, they're just poems that are in longer lines. And I don't write prose poems, I have like one prose poem in existence. Um, and then Fragment of Have a Queen is a very dense, decorous, very heavy line throughout, like, you know, almost like brocaded. So, and that was actually my intention with Fragment of Head of a Queen was when I was halfway through finishing it, um, there were some poems that people pushed back against that were more elaborate. And I realized that that was exactly the direction I wanted to go in. So I kind of rewrote Fragment of Head of a, Co Head of a Queen and made like everything like twice as long or even more elaborate just to see if I could do it. Almost like Henry James type, you know, of, you know, ridiculous. Um, so, so with this book, this book is different because it's a little bit more colloquial. It's definitely, there's more of a, the, the, the speaker's more casual in a lot of ways. There's a few poems in the book that are much more like, um, like two views of a discarded mattress that are very much in like, what I think of as a pretty typical mode for me, which is it's very decorous image laden line with a lot of like really loaded metaphorically and some like really like high diction that's very arch and aimed at, at certain you know at, at at expressing a certain thing war on fun is a little bit like that war on fun is not a loose poem by any means but a lot of the poems are looser and they're and i think they exist a little bit you know they're not like i think about the um the poem my father's daughter that's really just an it's like it's like a portrait of myself because I could really couldn't write in the eye about you know sort of myself after my father's death right and sort of you know the sense of looking at myself as, a, as this woman who's in her 40s smoking on a stoop you know that's one of the most pathetic images I can conjure of myself right you know um and so it's 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 just it's it's a different in that sort of it's also these poems are inhabiting some spaces that are just a lot more like familial or you know about friends and stuff like that you know so so I don't know if that answers your question, but I do think that it's, they're a little bit scrappier in a lot of ways, these poems. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like, I hear, I hear kind of all of these qualities in a way. Like, I mean, definitely there are moments that I pick up on that are more decorous or, or certainly um, sonically driven. And I hear almost even like formal sonics at times. Um, but, but of course, also these uh, images that are, I kind of think of a sort of lapidary or glitzy um, and that kind of thing happening. But then like, but like in some of the poems that you just cited, um, that they are looser, what I would almost even say is like associational. And this is kind of what I feel in some of the narrative elements of it, where it's like it's the sequence of details where the details are kind of trying to resonate with each other toward, um, to, to, you know, building on this kind of momentum, like toward this sort of destination, which is a, which is reckoning, you know, really, it's sort of the way I think of it. Like, mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of a, a, another question. Well, I, I, it's all these kind of like, ways of looking back like in the past you know and i think that that's something that's really crucial to like for my understanding of the poems in this book which is looking across this gap across this event horizon toward um these kind of formative moments um which are really kind of moments of people just like being shitty you know like and and what you do with that and and how you heal from that you know um so i'm definitely interested in hearing you kind of maybe maybe sort of talk about that a little bit like what 
what was your sense of reckoning like in the um, in sort of the creative process of, of going through these poems? Is that something that that you set out to do, or was it something that you felt yourself doing and then kind of began rolling with as you assembled the collection? Yeah, you know, I just had this image of, um, you know, the Johnstown flood in Pennsylvania, like when um, it was like this, mm -hmm. this um, lake, this man-made lake, um, you know, broke through and, and, and spilled into this town and carrying like all the refuge, carrying everything with it through the town, right? And just like, and it ended up crashing. There was this big fire of all the debris. And that's sort of, I think in some ways, it's sort of like the pushing forth of a poem. It picks up all these things that come along with it and just sort of carries them through, you know? Like that's, yeah, that's yeah. sort of, I'm, because I'm not like strategic. I'm just telling, I'm just sort of like remembering and, 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 and putting this thing together, you know what I'm saying? Um, but, you know, in terms of like a reckoning, one thing I will say that is different about the poems in these book, in this book, is that they came out of a process of writing a poem every week for a writing group. So when I came to Maine, I had very few friends here. And in the beginning, I realized my friends were fiction writers primarily. And I went and I did a reading, a local reading, and um, I met up with a couple with some poets, Jefferson Novicki and Colin Chaney. And we started a writing group because I realized I really needed the companionship of other poets. So that was what was very kind of difficult for me at the time. And Adrian Blevins was also part of that group and Catherine Larson joined. And so we meet every week and I, we write a poem every week. So the, I wasn't really consciously working on a book at that point. And I wasn't writing in the way that I typically write, which is to write many times a week at night. I write at night all the time and just start to compose a book and get a sense of a book right, of what's happening with that. I should also add that I always write three to five years in retrospect. I don't write really usually about things that are going on currently in my life. I mean, I might, but usually those poems don't end up being anything that's too great. You know, I'm, kind, I'm always kind of, yeah, I'm just always sort of looking back and trying to figure out what, what happened. Um, so, so, in a lot of ways, these were poems um, that I, I would go like to the public library and, and write a poem like two hours before we met and, or, you know, or just like, and, cause I, it's for some reason I always, it would be the night before, but it was always kind of rushed. So I ended up writing a lot of poems. I just, I was, I was writing them for me. And I think that's the point you maybe get to, of course, all my poems are for me and for my reader, but there, I think these poems were a little bit you know, I, 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 I sort of had this immediate audience and I was just sort of like, oh, okay, I'm gonna write about that. You know what I mean? They were the sort of one-offs. And so, and cause I wasn't really worried about it. You know, I wasn't worried about like, and I wasn't sending out. So, um, so when I, it was like a few years of this and I was like, oh shit, I have a book. Like I realized that all these poems had come together in, in this way that was a little bit different um, from, from how I normally put a book together. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's so I, I, I like that. That does feel like a looser process to me or something that is like letting yourself explore, you know, um, your your own kind of like psychic past. Like um, that, that kind of idea of the past, is, this, this gives me an opportunity to ask one of my intro questions um, that, that we um, have, have otherwise uh, haven't gotten to yet, um, which is if you could. I really do like to ask this question a lot. It's, it's, it's one of my favorites. Um, if, you, if you can like kind of like look back in your own history as an artist or as a writer um, and kind of describe for us one of the first moments that you recognized yourself um, in a work of art, you know, something where you felt that you were reading a book or watching a movie and kind of maybe finally felt at home, you know, with yourself in that work, um, something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And I just want, I want to make sure that I, that I book note, I, I want to add about your question about um, these poems. And I want to, so this, and I'm going to get back to your question, Rio, but that I think I became less concerned about um, pretending that my speaker was not me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I just really yeah, didn't totally. give a shit anymore because I'm in, in my late 40s, early 50s. It's like, so there's, you know, there's like, I let there be a way less of a sort of, you know, the, of, of a, the, it's like, it's like these piece of poems lie much more closely against my life, right? Against my lived life, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I guess like, you know, when I was, um, I would say the poem that immediately comes to mind that I really loved when I was a kid was like Stephen Crane's little poems. And one of those poems was um, Fast Road the Night. And um, I can I, I can bring it up. Um, yeah, can you read it? Yeah. 
Yeah, totally. It's really short. I liked short poems when I was a kid. Um, so my parents had, they, they didn't, you know, read me poetry or, but um, they had poetry anthologies around the house. And so I would go and look at those. So, and this is a poem that, um, this was a poem that I loved, still love. Fast rode the night with spurs hot and reeking, ever waving an eager sword to save my lady. Fast rode the night and leaped from saddle to war. Men of steel flickered and gleamed like riot of silver lights and the gold of the night's good banner still waved on the castle wall. A horse blowing, staggering, bloody thing, forgotten at foot of castle wall. A horse dead at foot of castle wall. So that's like, you wow. know, poem is freaking amazing. And I think you can see, you know, okay, there's the action of the poem and the glory of the he heroism. And then you, then, then the focus goes to the horse, you know, stag, yeah. Yeah. horse dead. So it just moved me so much. It made me so sad, you know? Um, and it just, it's like the story under the story, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I think I'm interested, I'm interested in the horse's story, you know? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's, I, 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 yeah. That's that that would be one example. I also really like Tennyson. Mm, and um yeah. yeah, I really liked um that poem Tears Idle Tears. I know not what they mean. Um and and I I I started to okay, so I also read, I read a lot when I was a kid, like a lot. I basically really didn't do schoolwork. I just read all my own books. I read a lot of historical romances, I read a lot of junk, read a lot of Anne Rice, a lot of just, my mother and I would go to the library and just like read all these books and trade them. And just like, you know, we were just like voracious readers. I wasn't allowed to watch television. So all I could do was read. And so, so a big book for me was Watership Down. It had a lot mm. of epigraphs in it. And that reading those epigraphs yeah. was really interesting for me. Like I would find poems in those epigraphs. And that's when I started, I wrote like one of my first poems about Watership Down as a book report. And then I started yeah. writing in like sixth grade. So that's when I was starting to really get into writing poems. And then seventh grade, then I sort of like, you know, I had not, not such a great time in school and we moved and it wasn't until I was a junior um, in high school that I was, ri I was writing, but that was when I knew for sure. I was like, oh, this is, this is what I'm going to do, you know? Yeah, yeah. It yeah. never it's, it's, That's so fascinating, those two. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of, um, kind of comparing the Stephen Crane poem that you just read and Watership Down and, and this idea, I mean, both, you know, animal, this connection with the animal world as, as being able to um, serve as a vehicle for a young person's understanding of like the violent, often like kind of fulfillment of, of a narrative or, or of a, the, you know, the, the exhaustion of one's commitment towards something, you know, um, something that, that, that is, that can be brutal, you know? Um, I mean, that's kind of what I hear. I mean, Watership Down is also one of my favorite, um, uh, but I, I, I mean, I know more of the, the animated film. I mean, I haven't read the book, but. Um, the movie's so much better. You know, I read that book like yeah. 11 times. And I, I, when yeah. I was like in sixth grade, I had a fever of 104 and I like hallucinated that I was Hazel, the chief rabbit. But anyway, yeah. you know, the poet Jennifer Militello, she also was obsessed with Watership Down. So when we connected, she has the whole, they have the special language. She has their language memorized and she'll like greet me with the special <laughs> language. <That's amazing. laughs> I love that. That's so great. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, this is kind of like, I mean, thinking about childhood and, and, and looking back at that, um, and this maybe, um, maybe this will be the kind of the last question I ask for, for, for this interview, because it, partly because I want to, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a hopeful person. I want to end on a hopeful note here a little bit. Um, and, and, but I, I had that motivation a little bit too, because like, I think that, um, Event Horizon has this hopeful ending to it. And, and we've talked a little bit about, um, kind of like the inclusion of that last poem um, about your child, but like a lot of it has to do with, you know, you've got this speaker who's looking back and is, and is sort of, again, this kind of reckoning with um, all of these sort of, you know, kind of bad moments um, in the past, but then looking toward um, your child and, and the kind of their self-actualization, their coming into their own self-possession, you know, um, in their identity and, and things. And like, maybe if you could, uh, yeah, I mean, if you could talk a little bit about the inclusion yeah. of that last poem and yeah. I would love to talk about that because, you know, it occurred to me while we're talking that that a big part of my childhood was animals. And I was really into tropical fish, like when I was a kid, really like I bred tropical fish and I've been in, into fish all my life. So when my kid turned 11, I think I got them a fish tank. And when during the pandemic, 
we ended up with a situation where, you know, we now have like three cats, a dog, a snake, and a frog, you know, we're like, we have so many animals. It's ridiculous. And so my kid is really like, um, I, 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 you know, it's, it's, I ended my last book with a poem about my kid, which is called next of kin. And it's like, you know, she'll spit, she'll spit you up on her pinkest bib or something like that, you know, because my, my child is, um, has always been so sort of righteous is, and, and they're a real inspiration to me, you know, like when I had the baby, the baby was like, would just smile and wave at everybody, you know, and I'd be like, what are you doing? Like, and like go, go up to go up and talk to people like, you know, dance and do robot dances in the frozen yogurt shop, which is a total trip, you know? So, so there, you know, so I think that the poems that are sort of, you know, threaded throughout the book about my kid, they are love, they're love poems and they're about they're about the child who who has a very very much a forward movement who moves into the future, you know. So so it was very important to me because I've been writing these poems about Emerson for several years um, to transition them since they transitioned to being non-binary a year ago. So I knew I had to write the I, I had to transition them within the book, and they are the future and they're beautiful, you know. And so and it's also the way that they conceive of gender is such a unexpected and fantastic answer to all the problems I've had with gender, which is fuck gender, fuck it, you know? And so, you know, so I, so yeah, I have a, I, I mean, I know that, you know, there's so many things to worry about now, you know, get everything every day in our world, there's, you know, um, but but I also think that the, that Gen Z is pretty amazing, you know, and they, um, I have students who are Gen Z students and my kid is Gen Z and they're, they're so sensitive and realized and passionate and everything. And, you know, and my kid has um, taught me a lot about how my kid will, like, for example, if I cut a line, if I cut in a line, they'll take me back to the end of it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like they check me, they check me. And they that's also amazing. know yeah. a lot more than I do about a lot of stuff. And so we have a relationship that's where I learn a lot from them and they use me as a sounding board for a lot of stuff, which has been, I think that's one reason that I've been on sort of the inside and I've learned, been, I've known about their transition from really early on, though they didn't share it with me right away. Because of course they were concerned that they might not be accepted by me. And that's really crushing to realize. So, so I don't know, you know, I feel like um, a lot of my future has to be, um, I have to be involved in, you know, activism on the part of LGBTQ people and trans people as a cis white woman. That's going to be something that I need to invest in, you know. So, yeah. 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 Absolutely. I, okay. I can't resist because you bring up this other question that I that I have here, and um, and uh, and that's kind of like if you see a role or a um. Um, or, or, or even a, a, a need, what's the word that I have here, um, a, a, re a requirement of what we maybe would have called feminist poetry um, to, to support LGBTQ or to, to, to support non-binary communities. Um, you know, I think this is a, a major kind of question um, lately. It's like, how, how should you be a feminist in a non-binary world? You know, um, <laughs> how's that? Um, you know, it's so funny because I used to just like love being a feminist. And I think I loved how it positioned me, you know, and um, I was very comfortable with it, but I was, I was um, engaged in a very white feminism, you know, and that was something that I didn't see at the time at all. You know, I had, I really didn't see it. And so now that, you know, I understand intersectionality and now that I have spent, you know, a lot of time engaged in anti-racist practice and thinking about that, and now that I also have a, a trans non-binary child, um, I don't think a lot about feminism because I see myself as a white woman having so much fucking privilege. It's ridiculous. And I see white women weaponizing themselves against other, I see against other women. So, you know, of course, at a time that, um, that you know, Roe versus, versus Wade is coming under attack, it, it's like, you know, I, I'm, try, I, I'm trying to sort of figure out where my feminism where it fits into all this stuff. Cause I know it has to be completely, it has to completely be integrated into anti-racist practice and into, you know, an, like into LGBTQ stuff, you know, it can't, it can't be separate from that. And I, and so, and you know, um, I've been doing this like course with um, Resma Menicum. He's like the, my grandmother's hands guy. And he, in this one session, he was pointing out that white women are very much 
pitted against white men. There's like a lot of anger that white women have against white men. And he is just like, it's fucking, he's just like, go fucking work on that. Right. Like that's your shit. And it was like, wow, you know, I mean, how, 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 what a great way to distract people from what the real work should be, but to get people to fight each other, I guess. I mean, that's probably very cliche. So I've been thinking about that too, about, you know, my, my, I have a lot of anger uh, uh, toward men and is that helpful? Is that, you know, what does that do? You know what I'm saying? So, so I, I think I have a lot of work to do in terms of figuring that stuff out, which is of course a little depressing for young folks out there to see someone in their fifties realizing that they still have work to do, but I guess it's also kind of good, but, um, but yeah, so I would, um, I think I'm still like, I'm still working on that. Yeah. I also see it more as like, you know, right now I'm more interested in, in identifying like, um, white supremacy, cultural norms and how they appear and how they appear. Mm -hmm. And they're very much embedded in patriarchy and all these things. And so just like recognizing Mm -hmm. things and seeing how those things play out in my own expression and expectations and, you know, just like checking those all the time and identifying them. And frankly, being in conversation with people whose, whose values are aligned with mine. That's been a really important thing for me over the past two years. Yeah, yeah. I, I, this, I'm, I'm actually, I, I mean, I know you, uh, you know, express uh, this, this, this challenge of feeling like that, that you, you have more work to do, but I, I'm very encouraged by that sentiment and, this, and the kind of messy honesty um, that I think we all need to embrace like as we you know uh, i remember from my perspective um that you know it's to, to move forward and, and that and that that kind of work is a testament of care um you know um and, and i think that's worthwhile like yeah. it also um, feels good it feels horrible but it also feels good you know because it's yeah. like um you know it's and it's and it's just like it's um just like a lot of the stuff I've, I've been engaged in which has really been pushing past my like really sitting in uncomfortable spaces big time um mm-hmm. It's just, um, it's such a, I feel like I'm, you know, I feel like I am not um, in denial in that sort of that, that yeah. you know, sort of like white denial where, oh, I don't have anything to do with this one. It's like, actually, you completely benefit from this your entire friggin' life. You know, just seeing it for what it is, is such a relief. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's, I think that's a good place to, to kind of end, uh, close this conversation, at least this chapter of this conversation. I hope there's uh, many more. Um, and uh, yeah. We didn't uh, well, talk I'm, about I'm Fox kind of, Line. We didn't have a conversation. The, I know, I know. Yeah, the space bag. I was going to bring that up actually at the beginning <laughs> of the, um, our affinity for it. I, uh, I've kept it. Um, it's been, it's really, I'm here in Colorado and it's been in the 90s. And so I kept actually a, my box wine in a fridge here just to keep things a little refreshing. So um, I raise a toast to you um, from afar uh, with the, <laughs> With the, with the box Portuguese wine, yeah. <laughs> um, really, really wonderful, Kate. Um, so uh, let, let's keep this going. I love talking to you so much um, and there's so much more to discuss in the future. Um, and uh, let's just call this chapter one, I think, of uh, this line break uh, <laughs> between the two of us, so. That sounds great. I love talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so great. Um, well, thank, thank you, Kate, uh, so much for being here. And uh, thank you all for tuning in um, and we'll see you next time. Uh, thanks so much.